Welcome to the third session in this introduction to corpus linguistics. In the previous session, we looked at frequency data and we reflected on how frequency data might be interpreted. In this session, we consider one of the more common and powerful search programs used with language corpora, concordancers. In this session, we're going to consider the following issues. What is a concordancer? How do we interpret concordance lines? How do we deal with large amounts of data manually? The main source of the activities and examples for this session is Susan Hunson's very useful volume, Corpora and Applied Linguistics, published in 2002. And we're going to be looking particularly at the activities in chapter three of that book. I would recommend taking a look at uh, Susan Hunson's book if you wish further information about the examples it will consider in the session. We'll be using some online corpora to check her results and interpretations. First of all, what is a concordance program? A concordancer is a program that searches a corpus for a word or phrase and presents those expressions or a sample of them amidst a number of words that come before and after. The central word or search item is often referred to as the node. Or a concordancer is sometimes called a keyword in context or quick program. The beauty of a concordance program is that we can pull together a lot of examples of a word or phrase and see those examples in a fairly limited context. Even in a limited context, patterns of usage and meaning should become apparent to the practiced analyst. One issue that concordance programs throw light upon is whether the central or a metaphorical meaning of a word or phrase is typical of its use. We can illustrate this issue by looking at one of Susan Hunson's examples, namely recipe. If you look up the word recipe in a standard dictionary, such as the Oxford Advanced Learner's Dictionary Online, you will see at least two possible meanings. The first is usually the literal or central meaning of the word, which here is a set of instructions for cooking something together with a list of ingredients. The second sense of recipe is more metaphorical. A recipe is used generally to mean any method or idea that seems likely to have a particular result. The question the dictionary does not necessarily answer is which of these two meanings is actually typical or which sense occurs more frequently in a corpus. A concordance search will help to answer that question. To explore this question, we can go to the Brigham Young University Corpus Suite and log on to the Corpus of Contemporary American English or COCA. We can choose to do a quick or concordant search and we can choose to sort the results alphabetically. If we type in recipe and click the keyword and context bar, we get the following results. You may wish to pause this recording and take a look at the current results, bearing in mind that these results may change over time as the corpus is enlarged. As you can see, the current results are all pretty much to do with the literal meaning of the word recipe as instructions to make some kind of meal. However, if we scroll down the screen to examples of recipe for, the pattern changes slightly. Here, as well as examples like recipe for a hot toddy, we find examples like recipe for destruction or recipe for political and government explosions. So, particularly when we use the preposition for after recipe, we can distinguish between the central meanings of how to cook something and the metaphorical but fairly typical meanings of an idea or method for getting a particular result. A selection of the central or literal meanings are shown on this slide. And some of the metaphorical meanings are shown on this slide. The results of the metaphorical meanings of recipe can be positive or negative. The negative meanings here are shown in red. The broader question that we are exploring through this example is whether meanings that we recognize intuitively as being central to an expression are or are not typical of its usage. As we can see, the central or literal meanings of recipe are very common, but the metaphorical meaning is also quite typical, especially when recipe is followed by for. When defining expressions or teaching their use to learners then, it is important to include information about typical uses 
as well as central meanings. And we might also want to include the grammatical characteristics that are associated with particular expressions and their meanings. But one problem with concordancing programs is probably already becoming evident as we work through this example. There is a lot of data to get through. Once we start working manually with corpora of over 520 million words, the current size of COCA, we have literally thousands of examples of common words and expressions to deal with. So how do we cope with this superabundance of data? One of the pioneers of corpus linguistics, Professor John Sinclair, suggested that when we are dealing with large amounts of concordance data, we do the following. First, we look at the first 30 concordance lines and we note any patterns that we might see. Then we look at the next 30 lines and note any new patterns. And then we continue 30 lines after 30 lines until no new patterns are evident. Sinclair called this sifting the data and it still works pretty well. We can adapt this method slightly to our own purposes. Susan Hunston refines Sinclair's method in her book on corpus linguistics. She suggests adapting Sinclair's sifting technique. She calls this hypothesis testing. First, consider a small selection of concordance lines and look for patterns. Then, do further searches to test your hypotheses and make new ones. Then continue until you have no more new hypotheses to test. We can try sifting or hypothesis testing with another one of Susan Hunson's examples, the common word suggestion, which we can often see around here in the University of Macau campus. To explore the use of the word suggestion, we run a similar quick or concordance search in the word, sorting the results alphabetically. If you scroll down, and look at the first 30 concordance lines or so, you can see some patterns emerging. You can then look at the next 30 lines and note any further patterns, and so on and so on, until no new further patterns emerge. After about 200 lines or so, the most and least frequent patterns look something like this. The word suggestion frequently occurs by itself, or with that. Less frequent patterns are with for, and two. We can then begin to look at the patterns in more detail. One way of doing this is by doing the searches again, but this time with suggestion that or suggestion for and so on as a search item. This will bring together particular patterns for us to study. If you look at the results for suggestion that, you'll find that probably as you guessed, the that phrase usually serves to define the nature of the suggestion. However, if you do a search for suggestion with, for example, you will probably find that the results are not particularly useful. Here, in many results, the with phrase does not go with the word suggestion at all, but with another expression that's part of a larger phrase, like respond with, and he responded to the suggestion with. We can discard these results as irrelevant to our study of suggestion. We can also dig deeper in various ways. For example, we can add a part of speech search to our exploration of suggestion by choosing verb infinitive from the POS or part of speech menu on the search page. This search will give us all the verbs that follow suggestion, as in suggestion to do something. This search will give us all the verbs that follow suggestion to. Some results are shown in this page. Bear in mind, your results might be a little different as the COCA content has expanded over time. Even if your results are a little bit different from the ones shown in the slide, there should be enough to indicate a pattern of meaning for this construction suggestion too. The examples from the corpus shown in this slide will be enough to demonstrate that meaning. Our well-known suggestion to have a joint venture, the suggestion to put Scott in charge, Kathy's day one suggestion to push incremental sales, a modest suggestion to read the Bible, my suggestion to use the seatbelt. In these examples, the two plus verb phrase construction explains the suggestion. This is the typical use of the construction, but there are a few exceptions, as in the following examples. Can you explain the meaning of the two plus verb phrase construction in these examples? 
He called me at Mr. Foster's suggestion to tell me that a, an accounting firm had been engaged. They used innuendo and suggestion to fan the flames of a tense racial environment. It's not too difficult, is it? Here the construction has a slightly different meaning, namely to express the purpose of the suggestion, for example, in order to tell me, or in order to fan the flames. What about relatively uncommon constructions like suggestion as to? Here, if we do a specific concordance search for suggestion as to, a typical pattern leaps out of the concordance lines. Can you see it? Yeah, looking closely, we can see that suggestion as to is often followed by a WH item, like how, or which, or where, plus a modal auxiliary verb, as in suggestion as to how I should wear them. To sum up so far then, a manual sifting or hypothesis testing using about 200 examples from the corpus of the use of suggestion in different contexts and its variant constructions can lead us to the following conclusions. The word suggestion often appears as a standalone noun. It often appears with a finite clause, with that which defines the suggestion. It sometimes appears with a non-finite clause beginning with two, which may explain the suggestion or express its purpose. Sometimes it's followed by prepositions like of or for. Seldom, but occasionally, it's followed by the complex preposition as to. When it is, a WH item and a modal auxiliary verb often follow as to. This expresses probability or obligation. To conclude this session then, concordancers are tremendously useful tools for the manual analysis of words and phrases. Even a limited context, say four or five words on either side of the node word or the search item, can reveal a wealth of information about the typical meanings of the word or expression. And these meanings might be literal or metaphorical. We can see how the senses shift according to how the words and expressions are used in particular grammatical constructions. For example, recipe for seems more likely to be used or more typically used in a met metaphorical sense. Concordances do have their limitations though. We may miss particular patterns even if we sift and hypothesis test. And sometimes more context is needed to understand the meaning or construction that our search item is part of. In the next session, we'll look at some of the ways of overcoming these limitations. In the meantime, however, in this session, we've covered the following ground. What a concordancer is and the nature of concordance lines. The difference between centrality of meaning and typicality of usage. And the process of sifting and hypothesis testing in the exploration of Lexis. All corpus linguists cut their teeth on the analysis of concordance lines. Why not choose some words and expressions of your own and see how they are patterned in a corpus of your choice? Thanks for your attention.